Hi, I'm Angus Cress Gillespie, your host here on East Brunswick Television, and I'm here with Chief Vincent Mann of West Milford, the Turtle Clan Chief of the Ramapo Lenape Nation in Passaic County. This tribal nation is made up of some 5,000 people living around the Ramapo Mountains of Bergen and Passaic Counties in northern New Jersey and in Rockland County in southern New York, about 25 miles from New York City. The Lenape language in this area was Muncie, an Algonquin dialect. Chief Mann has been an active spokesman for the Ramapo Lenape Nation, and it's my pleasure to welcome him to our studio today. Chief Man, you've received a great inheritance and legacy. You're currently the chief of the Turtle Clan mm -hmm. of the Ramapo Lenape Nation. But fill us in, who are the people of the Ramapo Lenape Nation? Um, we are the descendants of the Muncie. Um, we've, we've been in our uh, same location, uh, proven by archaeological evidence, uh, in written word and spoken word for 12,000 years. Um, we are the original inhabitants of New Jersey, northern New Jersey, um, southern New York, and western Connecticut. So the original language is Muncie. Mm -hmm. What is your name in Muncie? We Palani We Manato. Wow. And that means Eagle Spirit. Eagle Spirit. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, how did your ancestors survive uh, the invasion of the English and the Dutch? Uh, that's a good question. Um, the, the Ramapo Mountains at, uh, at one point were impenetrable, um, even written in old, old books that, uh, you know, there were the Ramapo Mountains no one went into. Um, and they're not suitable for conventional agriculture. Um, well, that's not necessarily true, right? Yeah. Because when you stand on the lower land, um, say Mawa, and you look up and you see the great Ramapo Mountains, uh, what you don't see is what's up there. Uh -huh. And so there were uh, many areas that were um, farmable um, and to be able to grow things and live there. But, uh, you know, we were able to uh, stay where we are um, because of that reason early on. And um, I would like to say that, you know, we were the ones that stayed were um, might have been stronger in will, um, stronger in the connectedness to the earth. Uh, in that sacred place, and because of that, we were willing to um, willing to change things in order to be able to stay where we were. So, so the English and the Dutch perceived the mountains as too difficult to bother to settle. Uh, Originally, yeah, um, that would be correct. Originally, oh, okay. And how did your ancestors avoid the forced migration out west? Uh, you know, that's a misconception, too. Okay. Um, I don't believe that there was any forced migration um, in New Jersey, um, southern New York. Uh, what there was was a, um, a decision to move back. So, like the Tappans, the, the Wappinger, or the um, uh, Hackensack, or the Pompans, you know, when they were, when they were feeling that encroachment, um, the place to come was to the Ramapo Mountains. Wow. And even with, even with that uh, encroachment of Dutch and English um, farms and things that people were coming, you know, they still didn't go up into the mountains. Mm -hmm. um, there were some that did, and typically I would say that they, they would be the ones that would be more apt to, uh, you know, to coincide, to live, live, live amongst each other in, in a good way. Um, uh, did your ancestors sell land to the European <laughs> settlers? Yes. Um, my great-grandfather, seven generations back, was uh, Manus, Chief Manus, and uh, he has uh, a couple of land deeds. Um, one is the, uh, 
I can never remember the name of it properly, but um, it was for the land, it was 42,000 acres, uh, which became the town of Slotesburg, New York. Oh. Um, he was also on, a, on another one with uh, himself and his two sons, Peter and Ari, uh, who were named after uh, Mr. LaRue, uh, who helped Manus in uh, legal affairs. Um, so out of respect and admiration uh, for what Mr. LaRue uh, did, uh, Manus, my grandfather, named his two sons after uh, Mr. LaRue's two sons. Oh, I, I remember that, yeah. 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 Um, did your ancestors face racial prejudice? <laughs> Still. Um, oh. that, that's, that's an ongoing uh, saga Good. for the Ramapo and um, you know, even for myself. You know, racism and bullying uh, was something that happened quite often. When, um, when you were growing up? When I was growing up, but even, so if you backed it up to the late 1700s, early 1800s, and into the early 1900s, uh, we were, our people were um, susceptible to uh, violent training studies school. Um, we were also were part of the uh, Cold Spring Laboratories, and that was the beginning of eugenics. Um, the woman who created Planned Parenthood, Margaret Sanger, um, there was her, the Rockefellers, the Harrimans, Bushes, Fords. Uh, they belonged to this consortium of, of very powerful, wealthy people. And the thought about eugenics back then was that they could breed, you know, the laziness out of you or the breed the drunkenness out of you, um, which obviously was, was not the case. You know, we weren't lazy. It was just that we wanted to live in the woods and hunt for our food and gather and um, make baskets. So it's a and culture and clash. Yes, and it's not documented that way, but it is that. Um, yeah. We also had a uh, the beginnings of um, a uh, boarding school, and that was on the New York side, where they took our children, boys and, and girls, and um, they taught them the domestic values, you know, uh, the European way and they were stripped of their language and stripped of the, the things that they would traditionally do. And it was before uh, the Carlisle School and other boarding schools like that. Uh -huh. So we were, in, we were kind of in a pivotal, pivotal place where uh, the documentation that surrounds us is not in the forms of, form of saying, well, you know, 50 Ramapo children went to the Carlisle Indian School. You know, but what we could say is that you know, 50 Ramapo children were a part of uh, Letchworth Village and, and a part of the Vineland Training School. Um, the, the Carlisle School has more uh, fame, more publicity. It was because it, it became more established, right? Yeah. Um, but we were at the forefront of that. Uh, just jumping back really quickly to uh, Margaret Sanger uh, and that consortium of people, they came up with 18 different ways to deal with the unwanted people of the Ramapo Mountains. And the number one way was by a public lethal gas chamber. And this was in the 1920s. And if you know, obviously, about the Holocaust and about when that took place and about how uh, Henry Ford was really good friends with Adolf Hitler, um, there's a story that goes with that. Um, but that little black book, that little black Bible that Hitler carried was not that. It was a study of eugenics huh. that originated here in New Jersey. Huh. Were there actual... Uh people led to the gas chamber, or it was just an idea? Um, it was, it was uh, the number one way, and that didn't happen. But what did happen at that um, Letchworth Village was that uh, the doctor who uh, was giving the females checkups actually was studying their anatomy and drawing their anatomy and learned how to sterilize them. So Ooh. that did happen. Ooh. Well, shifting gears, tell us a little bit about your work in cleaning up the Ford Superfund site. Right. Well, that saga is a 50-year saga. Um, <laughs> long story. <laughs> uh, well, it is a long story, but it, you know, it is connected to that past that we just uh, were just, talking about. Yeah. Um, Henry Ford and the Ford family, um, they built uh, the largest manufacturing automobile plant in North America, if not the world, um, right in Mawa. And when that land was purchased, they would have had to have seen the, the land deeds and the maps from 1710, the William Bond map, which shows where our longhouses were at that time. And so <clears throat> they built that plant there, and they started generating uh, toxic waste that needed to be disposed of. Um, they bought uh, land in Ringwood, and that land was bought under the guise of Ringwood Realty, which was a Ford subsidiary. And their idea was that they wanted to move 800 to 1,000 people out of there. Uh, Turtle Clan members, and that 
in doing so, they were going to create a, um, uh, what do you call it, executive housing. And so we fought against that. Um, some good local people fought against that because where were you going to stick a thousand people? Housing, right? And so uh, we kind of sealed our own fate in that too, though, because when Ford maintained uh, control over the land and we were able to stay there, living there, but the town of Ringwood um, actually wanted that waste to be disposed of there. And I think that there's a, you know, Ford did some, some dirty things, but the reality of it is that the town of Ringwood, um, the borough of Ringwood, did not allow for that toxic waste to be dumped there. It wouldn't have been. So, so the town of Ringwood was complicit. Uh, yeah, yeah, they're, they're, they're culpable. Um, they are a, uh, they're listed as a PRP, which is a potential responsible party. Uh, but they are responsible. If I, if you were the mayor of New Brunswick and I came and said, hey, I got some toxic waste I want to dump here, you have a choice, right? And that choice is to say yes or no. Uh, I actually am in possession of a letter from the mayor back then that said that I, the mayor and the council of Ringwood to Henry Ford Jr., we want all of your industrial waste from Mawa plant to come to Ringwood. Why would they want that? Well, uh, they, you know, it was about money. Um, so they were they were paid for. Uh, I'm, sh I'm sure. Yeah. Um, that part I haven't seen, but we do have the documents that show that they asked for that stuff to come there. Um, so the, there uh, must have been a quid pro quo. Uh, uh, yeah, and and not only that, um, what I also came to light uh, over the last year. Uh, so for a year, I badgered the EPA to uh, list New Jersey as a PRP. And my thought beyond that was behind that was that the state of New Jersey owns Peter's Mine, and Ford gave that to New Jersey. Now Peter's Mine is 2,400 feet deep and 17 levels and hundreds of miles of tunnels, right, with groundwater penetration. And so New Jersey, by ownership of that land, right, should be considered a PRP. Was, Just, was, that, a, was that a lead mine? Uh, no, it was steel. Steel, okay. Yeah, the, the Ringwood mines have been involved in every single war from the Revolutionary War to World War I, prepped yeah. for World War II by the federal government. Uh, the first 900 cannonballs came from that uh, for the Revolutionary War. Yeah. Um, all of the, uh, the cannons or the, or the weapons, the guns, um, changed it's across the park, Hudson. It's a state park, right? There. It is a yeah. state park now. Yeah. Um, our families are the ones that worked for the Hewitts, right? Mm -hmm. So when, when the Industrialized Revolution began, it was our Ramapo uh, relatives and ancestors who were there. Some decided to make charcoal, right? So they weren't involved with that. They just made charcoal. Mm -hmm. uh, others decided to work in the mine. Okay. Um, and then, so what ended up happening was they, they wanted to dispose of the toxic waste. They had no place to get it. And then there was some mob guys that were involved with the, uh -huh. with the carting of it. Uh, but that, I was asked, why do you want the state of New Jersey to be a PRP? And I explained that. So the EPA told me for a year, no, 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 no. Um, and then one day at a CAG meeting, a citizens advisory group meeting, uh, somebody had asked uh, Joe Gowers from the EPA that, was it true that the state of New Jersey actually permitted industrial waste to be dumped there? And when that question came out, I turned and looked at him. After asking him for a year, he's telling me no. Uh, he, he had no choice but to say yes. Mm. And I looked at him and I said, I expect that I will have that permit that was issued um, you know, in the email tomorrow. And he said, yes, chief man. Yeah. So I have an actual permit that the state of New Jersey authorized industrial waste to be dumped there as yeah. well. So that means that the state of New Jersey is also culpable. Yeah. Uh, they also are responsible. Um, and all of this, not, not just even our people, what the community is half the size or a little bit less than half of what it used to be because of the deaths. But there were health consequences. There still is health consequences. Yeah. I mean, we have a 30-year-old mother right now that has three kids and one's a year and a half old, and she's dying of cancer right now. So that um, so that would not be normal. Uh, for, uh, no, it's not. I mean, we, you know, we have one street there, Van Dunk Lane, where there's been over 20 deaths of can people with cancer. Um, never mind all the other ailments that yeah. come with it. So we're, we're still in that battle of trying to get it cleaned up. We're still in the battle of trying to get the people who are actually responsible held accountable. Um, and I believe that that's going to take place. Um, I think that with the new governor, that um, 
you know, he'll come through, that the people that he has underneath him will come through. I think that the new commissioner for uh, the Wanaku Reservoir, North Jersey Water Supply Commission, I think that he'll come through. Um, it's kind of hard to, to not admit mm. or to not show that you are responsible when we're in possession of those documents that say you are. Mm. And, you know, six million, up to six million people rely on that Wanaki Reservoir system. Of course. You know, that don't even know, right? Yeah. They don't even know what's taken place or what they've ingested or potentially ingested over the last 50 years. I want to move on to another problem. Mm -hmm. um, tell us just a bit about I'm going, to dis I'm going to disagree with you, but go ahead. <laughs> no, uh, tell us a little bit about uh, the um, Ramapo Lenape Nation's attempts to get federal rec recognition and how that got hung up. Sure. Uh, you're picking some really good topics, <laughs> <laughs> questions. Um, basically, when we filed for federal recognition as 1978 was when we were allowed to, and that wasn't just us, right? There was open to all tribes to apply for federal like recognition. An invitation. Yeah. Right. It, it became open. They had a process. The 83 regulations were established. And so we applied. And the BIA in 1994 stated that, um, that we were Afro-Dutch, right? So in 1994, they denied a petition, said we're Afro-Dutch. Also what happened in that time is they changed the regulations around. So we said, hey, let us file, you know, continue on with this uh, and through our appeal through that new process. So they said, okay. So basically it got denied again, but in 2000, we sued the BIA. A, a BIA just for our the listeners. Bureau in, the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Yeah. So we sued them. And when we sued the BIA, being Indians, right? We were like, hey, you said I'm not an Indian. So we sued them because of that. We didn't sue because of the process, right? Yeah. Because the process that was, should have been applied in those regulations was with reasonable likelihood. And they applied, um, what's the, I, correct, I don't know the word, uh, they, they applied absoluteness um, to it. Oh, I see, right? okay. And so where, you, where uh, in 1825, Victor Jackmont says, well, these mixed blood Indians living here in Green, Mal Green Mountain Valley Settlement are related to the 300, 300 mile away to those Indians. Uh, who, are, who were they, right? They were the Delaware or Muncie or Lenape. Um, that sh they should have said, yes, you know, that it's likely that they are. And what they said, well, we don't know who he was talking about. So they applied that absolute thought to us, which was not how those regulations should have been applied. So when we sued them in 2000, um, the judge asked their lawyer, you know, are they natives, native or not? And the lawyer for the BIA did not respond right away. And the judge finally said one more time, you know, I, I need this answer. Are you saying that they're natives or you're not? And the lawyer turns around and says, Your Honor, it's never been a question. And, and I wish that I would have been in the courtroom because I would have been held in contempt myself because I would have jumped up. Somebody should have jumped up and said, listen, they just perjured themselves. Right? Because in 1994, they said we're absolutely no native blood, that we're not natives. And then in 2000, when we're sitting in a court and we're suing you over that very thing, you say, oh, it's never been a question, when in actuality, it was a question. And so the judge says, well, I'm going to liken, I'm going to excuse my interpretation of this to the BIA. He said, I'm going to liken this to a loaf of bread. You're finding something wrong with the package, something wrong with the yeast, something wrong with the flour, something wrong with the salt, something wrong with the water. So the judge asked them, um, so what's the, what's the problem then? You know, why have you not given them their federal recognition? And the, uh, the lawyer said, well, Your Honor, we don't know which tribe of first contact that they come from. Well, yes, they do. Everybody knows. Everybody knows who the Ramapo are. Uh, we didn't have another name, right? We were always the Ramapo. When you look at some of the old documentation or even up to 1923, uh, the Smithsonian verified these canoes that were ancient, mm -hmm. and they considered us to be the ancient tribe, which means that we were here for a very, 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 very long time. Um, and we also had issues with Donald Trump and um, uh, Senator uh, or Congressman uh, uh, Torricelli. Um, you know, they, those were not so much political moves as they were financial moves in regards to Donald Trump. And um, so, you know, that was a part of it. The state of New Jersey was for us and then they became against us. Um, you know, why that was, 
you know, there was no casinos. There was no Indian gaming in 1978. You know, people try to say, oh, it was nine, you guys want gaming, you guys want gaming. It had nothing to do with that. Uh, it did for those who were trying to prevent us from becoming federally recognized. Um, should we have our federal recognition? Yes. Um, do we deserve that? Do our ancestors deserve to be respected and representative at that level? Absolutely. Um, the Ramapo have, have a long history of being able to stay in place. And that was because our Muncie ancestors, in my opinion, um, you know, they understood what it meant to honor a treaty, we'll say, right? Let's live next to each other. Let's coincide with each other. Let's, let's be here for a better benefit of each other. And that's why I said before that it's not, there was not a removal. Yeah. There was never a removal. So, and s some want to say that the Treaty of Easton was a removal document, but if those very people who were saying that actually read the Treaty of Easton, the first one or the second one, because there was two, they'll actually see that in there we, re we reserve the right to hunt, to fish, to gather, and to also to strip bark from trees. Now, we wouldn't st put strip bark from a tree, put it on our back, and go 1,000, 1,200 miles away, right? We use those for our houses. Of course. So the interpretation of the, uh, the actual thought back then is wrong. In 1982, the Ramapo Lenape got official state recognition from the state of New Jersey, mm -hmm. and that lasted for some 35 years to 2012. What went wrong? What, what happened? Uh, uh, nothing. <laughs> well, that's why I told you I was gonna. Yeah. I was gonna yeah. not agree with you. Yeah. Um, who said that we have no state recognition? Uh, John J. Hoffman, the Attorney who's, General. Who's he? <laughs> yeah. You know, he's never. He's never came to me, or he can. He's never came to our head chief, Chief Perry, and he's never offered up a document that says that we're rescinding your concurrent resolution as a, recognizing you as a state recognized tribe, and that is something that would have to happen. It would have to go back before, you know, the House and before the Senate in New Jersey to say that, you know, we're taking your recognition away. Yeah. And that hasn't happened. You know, that's the real argument. Yeah. It's, a play, a, of, it's a play of words once again. Yeah. Um, just like the Treaty of Easton. But it's, it's currently under litigation. Um, there, it, the Nantico are in litigation with yeah. the state of New Jersey over the recognition. Yeah. The Ramapo are not. Uh, not to say that that litigation would not benefit us in one way or course. the other. Yeah. Right? It's to benefit all the tribes in the state of New Jersey, but the Ramapo are not currently uh, in litigation with the state of New Jersey. And we operate and act as if we are state recognized because we are. Yeah. Um, unless somebody hands you me a document that I can take and show you, yeah. you know, or show the world that says we're rescinding this. Um, they haven't produced it. And it's just a play of words yeah. because when you ask the question, what they say now is because we when we when we said hey wait a minute what are you doing they were well we have no officially recognized state tribes right and because and that word officially or official would be by a bill right that would be a created and then a law would come yeah. right uh, which we did try to we did try to do that yeah. it pa passed the house like uh, 70 something to 18 and then uh, when it hit the senate um, it didn't even get to go to the vote. And the reason why was because the uh, senator that was uh, ahead of, he's passed on, Senator Whalen, but he wouldn't allow it to come to the floor for a vote. And the part of the reason was that he was the head of the uh, gaming uh, interests of the state of New Jersey. Uh, of course, yeah. So he, he should have. I, I, I find it very hard that somebody could hold up something yeah. like that um, where it could affect people's lives. Uh, humans, regardless of who they are. Um, what is being done to preserve the language? Oh, that's a good one. Um, we actually have a uh, language class once a month, and our language teacher, uh, Karen, she comes from Canada on the wow. Muncie, Del uh, Muncie Delaware Nation wow. Reserve. She comes down and she provides us with a uh, language class. Uh, briefly, why is state recognition important? State recognition is important because it establishes us to be recognized by a law. And when that happens, that means that we can apply for a federal grant money as a state recognized tribe. Those federal dollars through that grant would come in not only to help, not only would it come in to help our tribes directly, 
but there would also be money for infrastructure and things like that but that we would never even see, but that would be available to the state of New Jersey based upon the fact that we were recognized by that law. Um, does it have to be a law? No. But if it is a law, and we are recognized by law, that means we would have access to health care, um, housing, uh, college. Uh, we would have access to uh, funds possibly for creating cottage industry, mm -hmm. uh, which then in, in turn, all of those things would help uh, the state of New Jersey too, right? Yeah. Um, as well. You know, if we had the ability to create a urban Indian health care center, right? Mm -hmm. It wouldn't only be open to us, Right. It would also be open to other people that, in the surrounding community yeah. to be able to come in, which could help also, you know, um, with the relations and those smaller little micro communities that are around that are suffering as well. In the big picture, tell us a little, what is the concept of Turtle Island? The concept of Turtle Island in short um, is that in our, in our uh, creation story, um, there was a turtle and that uh, there were some animals on the back and eventually the muskrat uh, who was taunted by the other animals as being so small to go down to bring the earth back up from the bottom of the ocean to put on the top of the turtle. Uh, in the end the muskrat surfaced after a long time and floated up and uh, they noticed that there was something clenched in his hand, it was Paul, and when they opened it up it was the, the earth from the bottom of the ocean that was then put on the back of the turtle which grew into Turtle Island and the trees began to grow and the grass and all those other things and then eventually uh, what became Turtle Island is what we know as North America. And a follow-up question to that, what is the relationship with living things, animals in particular? Um, I'll even go one step further, it's not just the animals or the insects or the fish. It is also the water, the trees, the rocks, the plants. Um, understanding them, knowing that, you know, uh, dandelion uh, root may be beneficial to us. Well, it is beneficial to us um, to help curb diabetes. I mean, there's, uh, take it even further, right? When the Europeans came here and they were killing our people, they got sick as well. And when they were on the edge of the swamp or edge of the water and they were leaning against that tree that we all love when we were little kids, the weeping willow and that willow tree inside the bark, right, is aspirin. And so had they not have came in that way, uh, at that part of history, they would have learned from us all those things on this land that they could have used to, to help them health-wise, you know. Um, so, yeah. So we can learn a lot from studying the plants and the animals. Yeah, they, they, we are all connected. Um, and then I just thought, well, take it one step further. Last year, the Maori across the ocean were able to establish through Parliament that this particular river was a living being from the mountains to the sea and is afforded all of the rights of a living being like you and I, you know, um, in protections. And so our connection to those things are to know. Um, say when the tsunami came across the ocean with the earthquake, um, all of the animals and all the indigenous people who paid attention to those animals fled to higher ground because yeah. they knew something was happening way before, you know, the, hum the rather other humans who have been desensitized from nature realized that. I mean, there was even people who walked half a mile out and said, "Oh, what's that big, huge thing in the sky? Oh, that's not a that's not a tree. You know, that's not a mountain. That's not a building. That's a tidal wave." was their last thoughts, I can only imagine. Yeah, sure. But being connected to those things um, will enlighten us, that for, it'll help us with our health, it'll help us with um, understanding that there's rains coming, under, understanding yeah. there's floods coming. Um, it's a way better way of living. Chief um, Mann, I want to thank you for uh, sharing your thoughts with us here at East Brunswick Television. Absolutely. It's been a real pleasure. Yes, mine as well.